I went just a little fast over it because uh, not everyone is back. <laughs> <laughs> Now, today's task, today's task uh, is a little bit different, and it probably is not today's task alone. Like many of today's tasks, some of it will be put off until tomorrow or the next week. And I recall what I said in the initial lecture was that although my intention had originally been to give only four lectures, it became clear to me. I was preparing the, the lectures, and it's probably uh, clear to you now that four hours was not enough. And so my decision was to go on and to give about eight hours. That was a rough estimate. My decision was simply to go on and take as long as I needed, or to go on until there was no one left, whichever, whichever happened. Now, of course, you know, some of the people coming to the, to the lectures are quite busy, and it's not surprising that they can't always come. Uh, I just want to say that the notes are always available. And I've given a few people the, the, my notes and the transparencies from the first three lectures, and I have, will have a set for the subsequent lectures and so on. So if anyone wants them, he's welcome to them. Uh, now, as I said, today's task is, in a certain, is rather critical. We're going to make the step from the geometry to the algebra, and we're going to begin to understand what kinds of constructions you can find in Euclid. In other words, I, it's stated, stated clearly here, it's stated here as clearly as I want, that you know, we'll see that there's a correspondence between the geometry, geometrical constructions on the one hand and the algebra on the other. And if you analyze the algebra, and if you discover that you can get the number you're looking for with addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division, and the extraction of square roots, then you're fine. Then, indeed, you can find those same objects with the help of... Uh, Euclidean construction with the uh, ruler and compass. If, on the other hand, and we'll try to understand this, you analyze the situation algebraically and you discover that you, had to, you definitely have to extract the cube root and you're in trouble, then you can't. Uh, you will not be able to construct the object entirely geometrically. And the success of Gauss, which was our, which was our goal to understand, is that he understood how, for his particular problem, he could proceed by simply extracting square roots. And that's what we have to try to understand. And that was one of the beginnings, of course, of Galois theory. So today's task is to learn a little bit of analytic geometry that some of you know very well and others of you presumably don't know well at all. Uh, now, I'm going to have time to look and discover everything one needs to know, one should know, about the historical development of what one could call Cartesian geometry. But it seems to have taken place over about a century and a half, from the middle of the 16th to the end of the 17th. And I would say it was neither begun by Descartes, nor was it finished by him. But as it happens, his concerns were to some extent the same as ours, namely the discovery and analysis of geometric construction by algebraic means. On the other hand, the use of a rectilinear coordinate system, which is familiar to us, say, from various cities and for other reasons, is not to be found in Descartes. One doesn't see a de coordinate system in Descartes at all. Uh, Descartes published his views early in the 17th century, and coordinate systems, in a sense approximating ours, did not appear until late in the century apparently in the works of Newton and Leibniz. Now, uh, but as I said, Descartes' concerns are in some sense closer to ours because he was concerned with construction problems. And I'm not in a position to, at the moment at least, to discuss the other authors. Descartes has the advantage that he's published in the vernacular. It makes life easier for 
as modern, and not only that, he has even been translated, which is not the case for many of the other authors. So, uh, he's more accessible. All right. Now, everyone, I think, has a little familiarity with coordinate systems. So what I'm going to do, since uh, you know, I'm taking a long enough time as it is, I want to try to be efficient and quite ahistorical. I want to run through what's more or less a standard textbook treatment of uh, coordinate systems. And there'll be a few scattered references to Descartes, but they'll be mostly just for the fun of it. And uh, I will not be directly germane to our goal. Let's save this for later. We'll come back to that later. So recall that Cartesian analytic geometry is just a matter. We lay down, in our view at least, we lay down one line, which is called the x-axis, or the ordinate uh, axis of ascissus, and a second line, which is parallel through it, through a point that we choose. And that's called the y-axis, or, or axis of ordinates. A for abscissa comes before O for ordinates. And then if we have any other point in the plane, we think of this as a plane, then it has coordinates x and y, and x is, we, is this distance, where this is perpendicular to the x-axis, and y is that distance. So here is a sample set of points. And notice that we have to choose, we have to have a notion of distance. We have to decide whether we want distance to be, if we think of it as a real plane, whether the distance is an inch, a foot, a centimeter, or a mile, or a light year, or whatever. And if we have any point then, once we have the distance, we can see how far it is from the y-axis, and that's the first coordinate, the x, co x is x, and how far it is from the x-axis, how far up it is, and that's the second coordinate, which here is 1. Now, just the, the one of the coordinates could be positive. It could be, a, a, if it's on this side, the right side of the y-axis, the x-coordinate is positive. If it's below the x-axis, the x co the y-coordinate is negative, minus 1 in this case. Here the situation is opposite. To the left of the y-axis, the <coughs> first coordinate is negative. Above the x-axis, the second coordinate is positive. So I just, just, I just repeat that again with the second slide, that we have, that we have to choose the point, the, the origin, the point whose coordinates would be 0, 0. And I just recall, because it does come up later, that in Cartesian geometry, there is implicitly a length. But somehow, we just measure all other lengths in terms of the given one, so it's been replaced by a fewer number. Now, the next thing that we have to understand is the notion of congruence, which, of course, is, is, what is a part of Euclidean geometry. But we have to see how to make it explicit in terms of the algebra. So as a combination of translations, which I'll explain, and rotations. And I'm going to recall the formulas. So I assume this is easier than Euclid at, at, at the beginning. So suppose we have one point. This is translation. is to move. This point, this given coordinates x and y, up here. So here's the origin whose coordinates are implicitly 0, 0. And here's a point. And so we move that, so to speak, move from here to here. What if we do the same thing here? Just move it this much. Well, that means since a is this distance, the distance of the point on the y-axis, we have to move it over a. So we add a to the first coordinate, and then we have to move it up B. And B is this distance, and we move it up there, B. Now, I, I assume that since you know, coordinate systems and streets laid out in uh, rectangular patterns are so popular nowadays that this is familiar to everyone. And they usually sometimes even have unimaginative names like first, second, third, fourth, and fifth avenue, then it's it's clear what's happening. That is a translation, and it's an algebraic operation. We just we know this point, 
then we know this distance and this distance, and so we know what to add to x, and we know what to add to y. Could be negative too if we were translating downwards in some sense. Rotation is, of course, a harder matter. And uh, now, angles are a problem. We can measure angles in various ways. That's an angle, it's theta. We call it theta, give it a Greek name. And we have, to, we have to have a measurement of this, and we measure in terms of the distance, the length of this arc. Now we can, once again, we have to decide what units we're going to use for the length. We can either choo choose a unit which makes the total length 360, and then we call it degrees, or we can use a, a unit of length with respect to which the radius is 1, and then we speak of radians, and then it will be called the total length of the, of the, R, of the circumference is 2 pi. So now those are the two possibilities. So here we have a theta, or we can also, which is more convenient, and you'll be happy to know, measure it in terms of the sine theta and the cosine theta. So here this circle is supposed to be of radius 1. Here's our angle. And then we put in there, we put in this little right angle triangle. And this distance is cosine theta, and this distance is sine theta. I suppose that everyone has memories, pleasant or unpleasant, of the cosine and the sine. And we want a formula uh, for which tells us, suppose we have some point whose coordinates we know, x and y, and we rotate that point through a given angle. So the notion of rotation is clear, whose sine and cosine we know and we get to the point x prime, y prime. What are the coordinates of this point? Can we express them algebraically in terms of x and y? Can we express them relatively simply in terms of x and y? Well, as it happens, all criminals have found out the person from whose graphics I cribbed the answer uh, is here in the audience today, exceptionally. So, and you will remember, no doubt, what how to do it. Yeah, many of you, but not all. So, so this diagram that I'll explain is supposed to tell you that the new coordinates of this point, if you found by rotation, is our x times cosine theta minus y times sine theta, and y prime, the new second coordinate, <coughs> new ordinate is x times sine theta plus y times cosine theta. So the point is that these new coordinates are found just by multiplication. So rotation is something that we get algebraically simply with appropriate multiplications. x times the cosine and y times the sine. And these are two numbers here <coughs> which, which determine the angle theta. Notice that this circle, we call the circles of radius 1, so sine squared plus cosine squared is 1. All right. Oh, I've, I've got you. I think I can put it over here. I can close this up. All right, so let's see if we can convince ourselves of this. this. I think what we're seeing is that analytic geometry is easier than Euclid. But. So here we have, this is our point x, y. And it's at a distance. You see by the Pythagorean theorem, this distance is x, this distance is y, this distance is x, rather, and this is y. And for simplicity, I've taken x and y positive. And so the, by the Pythagorean theorem, this distance from here, the origin to there, is r squared is equal to x squared plus y squared. So the r is the square root of x squared plus y squared. Now, we have in this picture two, three triangles. This triangle, 
that wasn't in there originally, so it's a triangle that I said wasn't shown, but I changed my mind. And it's similar to this smaller triangle. That's clear. And this bigger tri this second triangle is also similar to this. Except it doesn't have the same orientation. We just we, it does. We just turn it around and move it up uh, and change the size. They're just similar. That means that, for example, this and what do we? That's why is that? That's because you have to think a little bit about the angles. But the point is that this is the angle theta through which I'm rotating, and this line. Okay. It goes through x prime, y prime, the new point. So this distance is r, and because I've rotated, I don't change distance. That new distance is r, and then through this point, I draw a line which is perpendicular to the original line here, on which x and y, x point x, y lies. I have that, and then I fill in this line is parallel to this, this line is parallel to that, and you have to give it, think about it for a minute, I'll leave that up to you, and you decide that indeed this angle is the same as this, this angle is the same as that, and of course this is the right angle, so this triangle and that triangle are similar. This said, well that said, what are these various distances? Well, here's theta, this is r. <coughs> Now maybe I'll come to this. I have it here. I've gone a little bit ahead. I'm sorry, what happened was that indeed more was blown off than I realized. Don't need that anymore. All right. So suppose you have a point x, x, y. We have an angle in here called the angle phi. And then Then, if this distance is r, then because this triangle is similar to this one, this distance is r sine phi, because this length is sine phi. And this long distance, cosine phi is just this little distance, this longer distance is r cosine phi. So we have this little triangle, in which this distance is 1, and then the side is sine and the cosine. And we stretch it, everything is similar, we stretch it by distance r, because r is this length, and we stretch the sides by r sine phi and r cosine phi, and we apply that to this situation, to this theta. The hypotenuse has been stretched by r, so this side has been stretched by r, and it becomes r cosine theta. So r cosine theta is a little bit over is uh, this length. For the same reason, r sine theta is that length, the same stretching. This, it, this triangle you have to think of as this triangle. And the same reason down here, so this is r cosine theta, that's this distance. And because this is r, this whole distance is x, this whole distance is y, so that when we make everything smaller by this factor cosine theta, and we make this side, side smaller by the same factor, and this side smaller by the same factor. So we now know by similar triangles that we just take from part of Euclid that we haven't discovered, what all those lengths are. But I can see you if I look. And you can talk to me easily. We're in a different situation than in the previous week. So I can, and I, I'm a little blinded by these lights, but in principle, 
comments are easily made and welcome. All right, so now we see what the situation is. We want to find, want to find say, y prime. How do we get up to y prime? That means I'm just taking for simplicity every x, y positive, and I'm not rotating so far that I'm way down here. That would just complicate the argument. So here, here's y prime. I get up to y prime by going up y cosine theta this far. And then when I move along here, I don't go up anymore. And then I continue. And see, I didn't, uh, and that should be, if this is r sine theta, then this is proportionately, <coughs> what have I done here? Yeah, this is proportion. This looks like, well, this is r, this is x, this is y. So this is r changed by this factor. So this side, which corresponds to the x side, will also be changed by the factor sine theta. And that becomes this x sine theta. So this, I just, this is x sine theta. This is y cosine theta. And when I add them together, I get y prime. In the same way, x cosine <coughs> theta, that's this. But now I have to move back. This is y sine theta, and I have to move back in the other direction. So I subtract it. And I end up with x prime. So I go up here. I go up here. This doesn't change anything. And then I move back here. And that tells me how far x prime is from this axis. So that's this formula, which is, so rotation, once again, is just a matter of multiplying and adding. So just let's apply it in another way. This is the same situation. I just put x and y in there, and I forgot to change the diagram. This should be some other bit, bit by me. This should be a, this angle C. It's just that situation over there. So I'm taking this, and I'm rotating. <coughs> but x itself is r cosine of phi, because this is, this is phi. So this is, by what I just explained, that's r cosine phi. And then for the same reason, y is r sine phi. And here's x prime. I've just replaced phi by phi plus theta. So here's x prime. It's r cosine of phi plus theta. And y is r sine of phi plus theta. So if I take this relation, substitute for x and y their values, and for x prime and y prime, their values. And we see there are a lot of r's that I just cancel and reduce to this. So here we have this formula that will be important later for us when we want to talk about complex numbers. So if we needed that, we needed, the, we needed this law, law for a cosine of the sum of two angles and the sine. This, this will, I'm sure, be familiar to many people. All right. That said, we now have at our disposal the two, two of the basic operations of Euclidean geometry, but algebraically, translation and rotation. Now let's just see what we're trying to do. I mean, what, let's see what Descartes wanted to do with analytic geometry. And before we start on Descartes, just to fix the dates, because we've jumped a lot. <coughs> We jumped a lot from 4th century BC to the 16th century AD. And I just point out to you that Descartes was preceded by people, and I've just taken not quite a random selection of names, but two or three names to indicate that Descartes, who was born almost at, towards the end of the 16th century, was preceded by people who are interested in algebra. They're interested in the solution of this equation and this equation. Ah, that reminds me, I've forgotten something. I, I, and let's come back to, let me do something that I omitted, that I omitted last week and that I promised to do this week. Namely, let's prove that theorem algebraically. All right, so um, 
we we didn't have the courage to uh, prove that theorem to give you I didn't have the courage to give Euclid's proof. It doesn't look like a straight line anymore, but let's give a, a proof using analytic geometry just to show that, show that analytic geometry is indeed useful. And that, as we'll see, Descartes says, uh, is a little bit sarcastic, of course, but that he says that you know, with, with his method, basically any idiot can deal with, with geometric problems and uh, <coughs> is kind enough to count himself among the idiots, but I don't think he really meant that. And uh, but let's just see how, in connection with this particular problem, now that we understand that Euclid is hard, uh, it can be solved by anyone. And let's, let's just remind, before we start, let's remind ourselves of a little algebra from school, namely, how do we solve this equation? You recall the formula. This is an equation. This is, uh, this is the way the solution is often written. Many people know that by heart, formula by heart. And I recall that to verify this, to solve this equation, what you do is you take this x squared, put it all by itself, the a out. I'm sorry, I just noticed when I was looking over these transparencies this morning that I'd forgotten an x, that's bx. You take the a out, and you take this bx, and you write it as bx. You put a 2 in the numerator, 2 in the denominator, so they're both redundant. And you put an a in the denominator because it will be canceled by this. So you have x squared plus 2bx over 2a, and you add to that b squared over 4a squared because when you do that, what's left in here is a square, namely this. As you see, if you work it out, is equal to the, the square of x plus b over 2a. You have x times x. You have b over 2a squared, which is this. And then you have x times b over 2a and b over 2a times x, which gives you bx over 2a twice. So this is a square, and we complete this. That's called completing the square. And since we added a times b squared over 4a squared in, we have to subtract it again. And then, so we have this equation. And we divide by a, get this equation, <coughs> which is the same as this, using the fact that this is a square. And then I solve it. So this is something that I'm reminding you of. So because we want to go on and mention briefly the case where we have an equation of degree equation of degree 3 or an equation of degree 4. So this is something familiar. You know how to solve an equation of degree 2. And that's all we need to deal with. So that's simple enough. And that's all we need to deal with our proposition, the one that we didn't have the courage to prove last time. So there's the situation. What do we want to prove? I recall we want to prove that this distance, this distance, times this distance is equal to the square of that distance. That's what we explained last time. So I introduce coordinates, and I introduce them in a useful, in a convenient way. I choose the origin here at this point D, and I choose that to be my x-axis and the y-axis, whatever it is. So here's my circle. There's D, and the circle has its center at some point A0, and it has a radius R. So suppose we look, suppose C is this point, x1, y1, and A is the point x2, y2. Then DC, so this distance is x1, no, this distance is y1, this distance is x1, so that those are the two sides of a right angle triangle. This is the hypotenuse, and it's square and hypotenuse, it's the sum of the square and the other two sides, so the hypotenuse itself is the square root of that. In a similar way, DA, this is x2, this is y2, and DA is the square root of that. Now, what is the proposition? affirm implicitly. It says that this distance, which is dc, times this distance, which is dA, equals that distance squared. 
In other words, it doesn't depend at all on where we draw that line. We could draw it down here, here, anywhere. We could move it around provided it intersects the circle. If it doesn't intersect the circle, we're in trouble. And this line is just a degenerate case when the two points are together. So what it says is that this, this product of these two distances, which Euclid would call an area, is doesn't depend where we draw the line, and therefore, in particular, if we draw the line just so that it touches, then C is equal to A, and we get DC times DA is in just DB squared. So that's the assertion. Implicitly, that's the, what that proposition says. It says that this distance times this distance, which algebraically is that, doesn't depend on the line. And then to see what it is, we, want, we just say, well, let's take the line here, and it's going to be the square of this distance, because that means that's the case that C becomes equal to A. All right? So we have to see if we can manage that. I'm going to move this someplace. Move it down here. All right. So this is it. This, this is the algebra. And as I said, it's straightforward. See, suppose. We draw this line where x is equal to 1. This is the origin. This is that. We draw this line where x is equal to 1. Then this will be some distance alpha, and this will be the distance 1. So this is alpha. This is 1. And we have similar triangles. This little triangle will be similar to this one, where we have coordinates x1 and y1. That means, in fact, or any point here will be similar. That means if we take its x coordinate out to here, its x, whatever it is, but then the ratio between y coordinate and x coordinate, any point, x, y, y over on the line will be such that y over x is equal to alpha over 1. I should have had a couple more. I should have simply said, here's point x, y. And, and there is the point, this is the point 1 alpha. And they're similar, and that means that the ratio of the sides of this triangle, alpha to 1, same as the ratio of the sides of the similar triangle, namely y to x. So any point on the line, and we apply in particular to x1, y1, and x2, y2. But these two points, in addition to being points on the line, are points on the circle. And we just chose coordinates. So this is at A0, the center. And that means the distance from any point on the circle, distance, which is given by its x distance, x minus a, for example, here, <coughs> x minus a. Or we want x minus a to be positive. We're up here someplace plus y squared is equal to the square of the radius, which we take to be r. But y, since it's on the line, is equal to alpha times x. If we're on the circle and the line, then y is alpha times x, and we have this equation. And we just proceed to solve it. <coughs> Explicitly, it's a quadratic equation. This should be an R. Excuse me, one second. But I was, must have been rushing when I prepared these slides. I tired. So, and that's, so this is the equation. We simplify. We put the two pieces involving x squared together. We get that. We have a piece involving x, which is this. And we have the piece in which there's no x, a squared minus r squared. And then we just solve the equation by the formula I recalled. And here are the two solutions. x2 is equal to that, and x1 is equal to that, because x2 is bigger than x1. So it has a plus here, where x1 has a minus. And what then is x1, x2? Well, we have to multiply this times this, 
the denominators are 2a times 2a, which is 4a squared. That's fine. Numerator is my, we do the four things. Minus b times b is b squared. Minus b times minus this square root, which is plus something or other. And then minus b times plus the square root, which is minus the same thing. We add them up and they cancel each other. So it doesn't even occur. And finally, we have b squared minus 4ac, the square root, times minus b squared minus 4ac, square root. And that means we just get minus b squared minus 4ac, which is here. And that's c over a. So this just says that this square root, the distance from the origin, so this distance, which by the Pythagorean theorem is this square root, is x1 squared plus alpha, uh, alpha squared x1 squared. I take the x1 out from under the square root. I get that. Same thing here. I multiply them together. I get 1 plus alpha squared x1 x2. But x1 x2, we just calculated. It's c over a. And c is this number. And a is this number, which we read off from this equation. c is a squared minus r squared. A is 1 plus alpha squared. Capital A is 1 plus alpha squared. So we have this number, which is that, which just depends upon A and R, and has nothing to do with the line. Nothing to do with the line. It doesn't depend upon its alpha, which determines where the line is. So that's the theorem that it would have cost us a great deal of work to demonstrate. And this is the kind of thing. I, I mean, Descartes, of course, wouldn't descend to this. This, this, he would want. He wanted to play in a certain sense hardball, but this is the kind of this is a simple application of the ideas of Descartes. We prove we want to prove this Euclidean statement about the fact that the distance from here to here times the distance from here to here is equal to the corresponding distance for the tangent, and we just see that all it involves is solve, solving some algebraic equation, and we see. We just write down what the distance is, therefore, and we see that it's a number which doesn't depend on the line. <coughs> uh, so that was solving quadratic equations, which, of course, are very easy and very old. And Descartes was, to some extent, informed and inspired. You see, he returned to it a lot by similar formulas for the solution of cubic and uh, by quadratic equations, so equations with x, where x appears to the third power, and equations where x appears to the fourth power. Now, our concern is not to discuss that. We want to pass on to the next century. And I just threw down these names. The name Desartes isn't too important in our connection. But Descartes and Fermat were, in some sense, in competition. Uh, I mean, they are the two names that are given when one speaks of the creators of uh, analytic geometry. But Fermat has, in some sense, a different point of view than Descartes. Maybe even a more important point of view. But Descartes is more fun. And as I said, Descartes wrote in the vernacular. So that's where he is. That's the, this is the taken from the edition in uh, our library. And I just draw your attention to the last line. That I tested a French friend, and he did know it by heart, the first line, rather. The first line that I'll give you, and it's a lovely line, and he continues in that vein, namely that he observes that common sense seems to be the commodity in the world that's most readily available, of which there's the most, because even those who are very demanding in other respects and dissatisfied feel they have enough common sense. And, uh, and he goes on in this vein, as those of you who have looked at the discours de la méthode uh, will know. And it's a, it's a lovely line, and uh, I don't suppose he meant it too seriously, but in some sense it is. Uh, he wants to apply that idea, and he wants, he wants it to be felt that analytic geometry is indeed 
something that can be applied by people who aren't particularly talented. And I suppose it was true. And what does he do at the very beginning? What does he do at okay, he do because he starts off <coughs> I, I point out that this is a funny book, this this particular book, because there's a philosophical part, and then there are three appendices. One on rainbows, one on uh, optics, and one on geometry. And there is some relation between the body of the work and the three appendices, <laughs> but it's a, comp a somewhat loose and at the same time somewhat complicated relation that I am not in prepared to explain. I want to... Do we need this? I think we want the second page of the of the uh, what I think is third appendix, the appendix on geometry, because he goes on to more complicated things. But he observes that you can do three things with algebraic algebraic. Uh, you can do three things geome geometrically. You can do multiplication. You can do division. A somewhat unusual uh, antiquated orthography here. You can do multiplication, and we'll see why. You can do division, and you can extract a square root. So one of our tasks is to understand that, to understand that these three geometrical operations are operations that you can perform with the help of a ruler and compass. And he, expl he doesn't go into much detail about multiplication and division. We will. And he, he, we will eventually come to this diagram here, which tells you how to extract uh, a square root. So we'll, we'll do that. And so in that sense, we are just imitating Descartes. So let's do, let's start with multiplication. So it's the same thing. <coughs> now, remember that in with Euclidean geometry, or we really should choose a basic length. So, so suppose this basic length is, is lambda. Usually lambda we'll think of as being one unit. Then all other lengths are measured by their ratio to the basic length. So this length is mu. This, we have this length mu is measured by the ratio mu over lambda. Think of lambda as being the unity, so it's one. Now suppose we want to multiply the length mu over lambda times the length nu over lambda. <coughs> then what do we have to do? Here's lambda. It's given on this line. Mu is given on this line. We draw, and then we put this, the distance nu we put on another line. The angle here is not important. And we draw parallel to this line a second line, and it intersects this line at the point eta. Now, this is parallel to this. So this bigger triangle is similar to the smaller triangle. That means that eta, the, the ratio of eta to nu is the same as the ratio of mu to lambda, which is just this. So that eta over nu, so eta over nu is equal to mu over lambda. So this number times this number is equal to this number times this number. This is the product we want. But that means that since the nu's cancel, eta over lambda, and I say lambda is, we can think of as being 1, is equal to mu times nu. So this gives us the product. That's why the product is something that can be done geometrically. And in the same way, if we were given instead of nu and mu, we were given mu and eta, then we could do the same thing, except this line would be primary, and the parallel line would be secondary, and we would construct nu from eta and mu. But the result would be that nu was the, the quotient of eta by mu. So say lambda, you should think, how you should think of eta over lambda as being the number, or 
to think of lambda as being 1 and eta of mu and mu as being renumbered. So to divide eta by mu, by, we do exactly the same thing, except that line is primary. So that explains multiplication and division. Um, but let me just point out something. Otherwise, it's not so clear. What do we do? What geometrical operations are implicit in multiplication and division? Well, they're draw it's drawing a pair one line parallel to another. What does that mean? Well, before I do that, let me give you another way to divide by 2. You recall how you divide by 2? You bisect the line the line between those two points. So this is the where it's bisected. So this length is one half of that length. And you recall, it's one of the simplest things, one of the, I guess, uh, the most amusing things to do for relatively young children is you take this circle and you take this circle and you draw this line. So dividing by 2 really involves the intersection of two circles. So it, it, it will look as we go later on as though the intersection of two circles is redundant, but we do use it here to divide. And of course, we use it more, more generally if we want to draw, to draw one line parallel to another through any, to a given point, as we do here. What we do is we take the line, we take the point, we draw a circle around that point, intersects the line at two points, then we just move those points down a little. Well, it doesn't matter where we move them to, but we move them simultaneously. So that's that. And then we take, not changing the opening of our compass, we take a circle here, intersect with a circle here, and then this point is at the same distance on the line as this point. So that would be the parallel line. So that's just to say that indeed multiplication, implicit in multiplication and division is the intersection of two circles. Right? There, there are various people who have more patience than I who have asked themselves how many circles does one need to perform all the constructions of you, that you can perform with an arbitrary number of circles, but we won't ask ourselves this question. It's a fairly small number, but as far as I know, it's more than one. All right? So, at this point, we know that multiplication and division correspond to geometric operations. We want to know whether, whether taking the square root, as uh, Descartes affirmed, also is a geometric operation. So. Before we do that, let me look at what the equations are for two simple objects in uh, Euclidean geometry, namely for circles and for lines. Because, as I said, all, our, all we can do in Euclidean geometry is intersect circles and lines. That's all, those are all that's all that we have our, at our disposal, at least by the rules we've given ourselves. So, what about a circle? I don't know. Those of you who took freshman count, or at least what nowadays is probably ninth grade algebra, have a, a year's painful lessons compressed into one hour. So here's here's a circle. This circle whose center is at the origin, so the point on there is x, y, so its distance is say r, so that means that x squared plus y squared, which are the sums of the two squares on the two sides of a right angle triangle we have to imagine in there, is equal to square of the hypotenuse, which is r squared. So 
This is the equation of a circle there. We want any other circle. We move it down to the origin. So we just move everything down to the origin, translating centers at AB. We translate the center back to the origin. Everything comes with it. So the point x and y goes to x minus y, a, y minus b. And the new point then just is any point on this circle just moves down to a corresponding point on this circle. And it satisfies the equation of this circle, which is that. And then we just expand out. If we want something expanded, we have an x squared and a y squared. And we have, if we're doing our algebra properly, minus 2ax and minus 2by. That's, uh, uh, it didn't work out here. That's minus. And that's minus. And then we have whatever is left over as some number. So a squared plus b squared. And we bring r over the other side, or we bring minus r squared, and that's d. So the equation looks like that. So I said I just could tell you how we, how you would square something. I've used this over and over again. So that's the equation of a circle. Give an equation of a line. All we need are the equations of circles and lines. We just want to see what happens when we intersect them. So there's a line. A line. Let's take a line that passes through this origin, 0, 0 first. Here's some point on it, AB. And here's an arbitrary point on X and Y. And we use the similar triangles. So X is to A as Y is to B. And that means this equation which I rewrite as ay equals bx, or bx minus ay equals 0. So that's the equation of a line which contains the point for which x and y are both 0. We have an arbitrary <coughs> an arbitrary line. So this, we just take some point on it. We move, we move that point back to the origin, and then we move everything else in exactly the same way. So this one comes down here, and this one comes down here. We have these new points. These are points on a line through the origin. So we compare the situation with the one we, we analyze with A, B, X, Y. Now A, B is C minus A, B minus B. And x is x minus a, y minus b. So we have just rewriting this equation for the new line moved over with the, with the new point. We have that with, in which there's an x multiplied by something, a y multiplied by something, and then something involving a, b, c, and d, which are just two arbitrary points on the line. And we can't specify a line without at least two points, and we put those together in some way to get this number g, and to get e and to get f. So the equation of a line is just this linear equation, the equation which x and y appear to the first power, and e is this number, which is built up from two points. f is this number, which is minus that number, which is built up from two points, and g is this number. So that's the equation of a line. So what that means we're now in a position to ask ourselves what the equation is, for example, of the intersect. Where do two lines intersect? One of the things we want to do. How does a line intersect a circle? We've already done that once. We'll do it again. And how do two circles intersect? And of course, what we're going to see, and this is, this is basically all we want to know, is that Intersecting two lines doesn't really give anything. And intersecting a line with a circle is what gives the square root. So this is, this is all we need to know. We want to get back to Descartes' construction. But just for completeness, I'm doing 
the intersection of two lines as well. I don't, I don't need it. I don't, know why, I don't even know why I'm doing it, but here it is. There are two lines that intersect, and we just wanted to find out how to, so this is a line with an equation in x case x minus y equals 1. This is another line with a similar equation, x plus y equals 3. And we just want to find out how we go about calculating the point where they intersect. So that's that. And what you do is, what you do, observe, I don't think I'll do this. What you do is you observe is if they're parallel, this is, this is one line. <coughs> this is another. This should be a plus. And what you, this is another line. And what we observe here, this is the first part, is if this is satisfied, if that's equal to zero, then the lines are parallel. If they're not parallel, then this isn't equal to zero. And then any point where they meet will satisfy this equation and this equation. Now, I just remind you that you can solve it. And the way you solve it is you multiply the first one by f prime and the second one by f. And then you subtract. And then the part with y disappears. You're left with something with an x alone, times, in this case, f e minus f prime e minus f e prime, something with x, and something which is a number, a number which is determined from four, two points, four points, two in one line and two in the other. And then x is this. And you get it y in the same way. The point is that this is not 0. But it's not important. We don't need it. We do, this is not something we need for our, our purposes. All we want to do is be sure that it doesn't give us anything new. In other words, this x, the x coordinate of the point of intersection, is built up by multiplication, subtraction, and division from what looks to be six numbers. But these six numbers are the numbers that appear in the equation of the line. And as we observe when building up this equation, they're all numbers that are defined in terms of the coordinates of two points on the one line, two points on the other. So we're not getting anywhere. We know, before we know a line, we have to know two points. So this is something that's included in the fact that we can um, add, subtract, multiply, and divide by, with Euclidean constructions. One might want to observe, however, that in a given problem, if we went back and added, subtracted, multiplying, and divided with the help of intersection of circles, it would be much more complicated. So uh, the fact that we can do it one way rather than another doesn't mean we should do it the first way. The first way might be quite a bit more complicated than the second way. The first geometrical construction, for example, if we tried to build up this number from the four points that we were given with the help of uh, intersections of circles. Here we go. This is almost 529. Um, I think I, I, I will not do this this time. Uh, I'll come back to it next time. This intersection of a line and a circle is not the case considered by Descartes, who chooses his line and chooses his line and his circle uh, in, in a convenient way. But all I want to observe here is that we now see, when intersecting a line and a circle, we see a square root. So if you want to give a particular square root, we just we choose the line correctly and the circle correctly, as did Descartes. Uh, but I think I'll leave that till next time. Leave um, till next time the repetition of 
Descartes construction leave till next time the intersection of uh, two circles and also although that's perhaps the most fun and that's what we all we will need we don't even need the intersection of two circles it's just to show you that indeed it doesn't give anything more than division and multiplication and uh, then all we'll do with Cartesian geometry is just take a look at what Descartes actually did with some of, uh, of the diagrams. I'll give you this. We'll come back to it, and I'll explain what it is. He was shooting for bigger things than we are. So we'll have to come back to this. Uh, he, and I, I don't think I'll even explain when we come back to it what these diagrams are. But he's shooting for big things. He wants to construct geometrically cube roots. And you'll notice that uh, he doesn't have circles anymore. He has parabolas. And uh, what he, he needs. And from then, once we... So, so that will be a digression just to see what Descartes does. And then we can go on to another so to speak, tutoring session, one hour in which we do complex numbers. Right? Uh, because uh, what we want to do is to understand the relation between complex numbers and points in the plane, between complex numbers and the pentagon, regular pentagon, and then we should be in a position <coughs> to begin the, uh, uh, the first at a rudimentary level and then at Gauss's level of uh, the construction of regular pentagons, uh, algebraically. So that's just to say that next week will be a little more analytic geometry, some complex numbers, and as usual, it takes probably more than the next week to finish the complex numbers. And then it will be probably two or three days with two or three hours with, uh, with Gauss. So that's about twice what I originally expected. And, uh, but uh, it's probably twice what, twice what anyone else expected. That's, that's the situation. Mm.